Well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And we're very fortunate to have uh, our speaker today. I have to say that it is a great pleasure for us to have a chance to chat with Ramson Lamatawama this afternoon. He's certainly no stranger to the Arizona State Museum, a man of many talents, poet, Katsina doll carver, jewelry maker. And over the last two decades, uh, he's been working in glass, which we'll be hearing about today. Uh, Ramson was uh, born in California and attended high school in Flagstaff. He then studied at Goddard College in Vermont and throughout his adult life has traveled the country and the world sharing his art and his uh, perspectives on Hopi culture. Our friends group visited Ramson at his studio several years back and got a chance to see him at work in person. And thanks to the suggestion of Gail Gibbons, who is on the Friends Program Committee, we're able to check in with him today to hear what he's been up to since. We hope to have the chance to visit Ramson again at his home on the Hopi Mesas, but for now, straight from Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he is in residency at the Institute of American Indian Arts, let us welcome Ramson Lomatawama. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ramson Lamatawaima, for those people who have never seen my face <laughs> or heard my name. Uh, I'm from the Hopi Reservation in Northeastern Arizona. And uh, basically I've, I've done a lot of different things in my life and I consider myself very fortunate and blessed. Uh, I've had a chance to travel uh, quite extensively. And during those travels, I really learned a lot about other cultures. Uh, actually, I'm retired from teaching sociology at North Central College in Naperville, Illinois, and I spend the, uh, the majority of my time in my glass blowing studio on the Hopi Reservation. Uh, so what I have for you today is a, a very short uh, PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to go ahead and get started with, if we may. I decided to uh, just uh, think about where I've been uh, for the past uh, 68 years. Um, and, you know, what are some of the things that kind of helped to mold me to who I am today? And a lot of it has to do with landscapes, uh, with um, our culture, our mythology, uh, our way of life. And um, my own experiences as an individual. Uh, so I decided to just look at landscapes and life in general and just share a little bit with you about how I express these things in glass art. So we can uh, just move around. And by the way, uh, this is um, a picture of my uh, cornfield uh, below the mesas, uh, which I haven't had a chance to uh, plow or plant yet for several years because of the drought, but I plan to get back into the swing of things this coming spring. Okay, so if we can just uh, move on to the next slide. Okay, these are some pretty recent works and what I'm trying to do at this point in, in my life is to take different concepts and bring them together. Uh, these four pieces uh, is a part of a series called uh, Whirlpool Blossoms. I've taken the idea of a whirlpool that I've seen in many, many locations and uh, the blossoms that we see uh, along the landscapes in terms of, you know, the flowers and the patterns of the flowers and just integrated that into the idea of a swirling whirlpool in a little body of water. And this was the result. Um, for me, bringing ideas together has been the focus of maybe the last uh, 10 years of my life because um, it's, you know, when you reach a certain point in your life, your perspectives and your feelings and your thoughts um, really start to come together. They go through a change of sorts and then you begin to figure things out. Um, so, you know, uh, unfortunately for a lot of us, it doesn't happen until we get on the home stretch before we figure things out. But uh, I just try to, to 
bring all of this um, this together, and hopefully people will be able to relate to that. All right, next one. Uh, in Hopi culture, we talk about birth quite a bit and the cycle of life. Uh, you know, we've heard the term the circle of life quite often, but to me, uh, a circle is two dimensional, but a sphere is three dimensional. So I like to look at the idea of uh, the life cycle in terms of a sphere rather than uh, a circle. So a lot of my history uh, goes back to um, the, the stories that we grew up with. Uh, Hopis generally believe that we came from a place called the Sipa Apuni, which is somewhere in the Grand Canyon. We emerged into this world from a lower world uh, in the hopes of finding a better life here. And uh, that's pretty much the beginning of, of our lives here on this fourth world, as we call this place. Uh, so coming from a culture that has a very, very rich and extensive mythical history, uh, I tried to bring the idea of the, the idea of birth, in other words, renewal, um, and, uh, and how it works into this idea of cycles. Uh, so I took the idea of the Sipa Apani and brought it to where we are today on the Hopi Reservation. On the right side, you see the modeled uh, pattern of the sandstone that's very, very common uh, on our reservation. So I took the idea of, of the emergence from the Grand Canyon which you see as the opening on top of this uh, earth, earthy like looking uh, vessel. Uh, but if you look at the colors on the vessel itself, they resemble the sandstone that we see on the Hopi reservation today. Uh, so to me, uh, I'm here for a little while in terms of my own life cycle, uh, but there's a greater cycle that's uh, going on around us. And it's kind of the universal thing. You know, we, uh, we look at the idea of the universe as being very expansive. And um, when you look at the cosmos and when you look at astronomy and all these things, uh, this universe is, is full of cyclical manifestations. And so that's the way it works. Uh, in the Hopi culture, we talk about birth uh, and from there you go to infancy, to childhood, to adolescence, and hopefully somewhere in there we mature. And then you close out your life uh, with uh, uh, the grand exit, as I call it. But that's not uh, where it ends uh, because the Hopis do have an idea of an afterlife. And so once you leave this life cycle, you're ready to be born into the next one. And so it's just the idea of land, of birth, and of cycles that I'm trying to bring together. Uh, the next slide, if we can go to that one, is um, uh, a personal thing for me. Um, I, I've been in a 12-step program for over eight and a half years now. And uh, I found sobriety uh, rather late in my life, but you know I really appreciate it. And I just wanted to, to speak to the idea of serenity, of being in that central place where you just kind of go into yourself and uh, you find yourself somewhere in there. Uh, and while you're doing this, the world is still revolving around you. There's, there's movement on the external, but on the internal, there's this stillness, there's this calm, and there's this serenity. Uh, so staying with the idea of the landscapes, I, I uh, took the idea of the rock formations that we have on the reservation, and they're very spherical. Uh, and as I said before, to me, life is not a circle, it's a sphere. 
And uh, on the lower left, you see a photograph of a location called The Wave in, in southern Utah. And there's a lot of movement there. So I combined the two ideas. And as a result, uh, the glass piece on the right side uh, kind of speaks to that idea of the stillness and the calm and the serenity of being centered uh, in the middle while the movement and the chaos and whatever we have in the world uh, is swirling around us. Uh, the picture in the center is of me just kind of trying to find that center point for a few minutes. Uh, that was taken at uh, a museum in Japan when I was doing some consulting work there. And it's to me, this just uh, is a way for me to try and get centered before I do my work, after I do my work, um, just meditation has become a very big part of my life. So, you know, there, there's a saying that, um, that you just find the, the calm in the middle of the storm. And uh, as long, you know, I may be surrounded with a lot of negativity in this life, but I don't have to contaminate myself with that. Instead, what I do is I go to that center and there's stillness, there's calmness there. And when you come back into this world, you're okay. You know, you can deal with life a lot better. All right, so the next slide that we have here uh, is speaking to the history of our people. Uh, the Hopi history is both mythical and it has to do with real time. Um, we have a history of migrating here in the Southwest in order to find our ultimate destination. So according to Hopi history and Hopi tradition, our ancestors uh, wandered uh, in, in this world for quite some time and they built up communities in a lot of different places. Uh, but they realized that that was not where they were to stay. They were still finding that ultimate destination. And when I look at our history and all these archaeological sites in the Southwest, uh, I see that people came to a place, they settled down for several generations maybe, uh, they built up homes, they built their communities, their cornfields, their shrines, their granaries, I mean, this was uh, their life, but at some point in time, uh, they're given a sign uh, that tells them to keep on going, to keep on moving. And when these people were ready to leave, uh, according to the older people that I spoke with, the people uh, who were leaving these communities uh, painted these images on the cliff walls and these depicted spirits that would watch over the place that they were uh, leaving. And so I took that idea of the history and the idea of uh, protection um, and translated that into glass. So, you know, the silhouettes of the glass figures that you see there uh, resemble the ones on the cliff walls. Uh, the advantage that I have working with glass is that uh, I can use color and uh, colors are very important to Hopi. You know, we, we use colors to symbolize different directions and different concepts. And uh, so I'm, you know, I can express a lot more of my own personal thoughts and my own stories by using the different colors that we have in the glass, um, but still trying to retain the, the core of the idea of our history uh, that these um, images present to us. So to me, there's, there's a, a bridge there as to who they were uh, and who we are today. And there, there's definitely a connection that we all have with our ancestral histories. Okay, next one, please. Uh, we're an agricultural people. Our mainstay is corn. 
uh, corn is involved in just about every aspect of Hopi culture. And we, again, taking the idea of bringing two different ideas together into one, uh, we, you know, we come up with this idea of the corn maiden, which is a very important image and uh, idea in Hopi life. Uh, we look to the corn plant as being of the feminine principle because they are female, they produce uh, food for us, they bring us children in the form of the ears of corn. And you can see there uh, the, the colors of the corn represent the four cardinal directions. Uh, yellow being the north, blue being the west, um, red being the south, and white is the east. And what I was brought up with is this idea that the color yellow exists in this world to constantly remind us to approach life with a positive attitude. Uh, all the good things in life come from a positive attitude. The blue represents any type of moisture, uh, whether it be rain or a, a puddle or the ocean or a creek or a river, uh, any type of uh, moisture is depicted by the blue. And then the red corn symbolizes warmth and heat, uh, which the sun provides for us. And lastly, for the east, we have the white corn which can symbolize purity or it can symbolize snow. So these colors uh, have an important role in our culture. And these are the predominant colors that you see in a lot of uh, traditional and contemporary Hopi art. So I, I, I took the image of an ear of corn. And as you can see in the glass piece there, uh, the body of the figure is reminiscent of an ear of corn, and there is a corn plant on there uh, that uh, speaks to this idea of life uh, coming to us, and right above it is the, the uh, clouds and the rain coming down. And then uh, at the base, you see the different levels uh, which symbolize the four worlds uh, that the Hopis uh, believe in. And then on the right, you see a young uh, Hopi girl with her butterfly uh, whorls, um, the way that they make their hair for uh, ceremonies and things. Um, the hair whorls represent butterflies. And uh, this is a hairdo that's specific to uh, girls who are capable of bearing children, but they're not married yet. Uh, once a girl, gets married and goes through the wedding ceremony, she does not wear her hair like that again. Um, married women have a different hairstyle. So to me, this, this talks about the importance and the significance of the female principle in life. Life can't go on unless we have females there. Uh, so I, I've been doing these corn maidens now for, uh, you know, probably 10, 15 years. Uh, just in, in a variety of ways. Uh, this particular piece that you see is a blown piece and uh, it's got two different colors on it. And uh, um, the top layer is the blue and the underlying color is white. So what I did was I uh, masked it with uh, resist, uh, cut out uh, the areas that I wanted to sandblast. And as a result, you sandblast the blue area away and you come up with the white background. Uh, so this is uh, the type of thing that I, I try to communicate. Okay, next one. Uh, I've had a very, very deep interest in members pottery for, uh, you know, 30, 30 plus years. And what kicked off this for me was studying uh, Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, and Carl Jung, uh, the psychologist. And a lot of their ideas and their theories and their perspectives uh, struck a very, very strong chord with me. And uh, looking back at my own history, I was really intrigued 
with uh, the ceramics from the Mimbras culture. So I was very fortunate uh, several years ago to be involved with a Mimbras pottery project that was being conducted by uh, New Mexico State University in Las Cruces. And several other Hopi artists and myself uh, spent uh, about two or three years working on this project, uh, looking at uh, Mimbras ceramics and just trying to um, piece together what we felt was a connection uh, to this particular culture. And as part of the culmination of the project, uh, the museum asked us to produce a work of art that would speak to the project. So I took um, uh, Mimbra's pottery and, and just looked at the geometrics, look at the pattern, look at the imagery that they were presenting to us. And um, uh, I integrated some of those into this corn maiden. So this corn maiden was made specifically for that uh, exhibit down at NMSU. Uh, and this was probably one of the most rewarding things that I've ever done in my lifetime because I gained a lot of knowledge, uh, a lot of clearer understanding about everything about members culture and how we uh, continue some of these traditions in contemporary art. Thank you. Those were fantastic pictures and, and great stories. Um, I was uh, wondering if you could share a little bit about what you're doing in Santa Fe and uh, what your plans are for the time that you're in residency at the Institute. Okay, well, maybe at the top of my list is eating as much sushi as I possibly can <laughs> while I'm here. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm, I'm here for a six week slot as an artist in resident at the Amer uh, Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, I arrived here the last week of October and uh, my session will end at the end of the first week in December. Uh, and what I'm here to do is to grow uh, in the arts. Uh, one thing that I'm really looking forward to is uh, learning how to cast in bronze, which I've never done before, and use bronze castings and integrate that into the glass art that I do. Uh, the school here does have a hot shop or a glass blowing studio uh, are right on site. So I've been really uh, taking advantage of that time to create a few pieces, uh, you know, when I can find some spare time. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, concept work uh, here, uh, looking at doing different things in different ways with glass. And this is really a chance for me to develop new ideas and to see if they'll work. Uh, so I've really been enjoying my time here. Everyone here has been very, very hospitable, so helpful and so friendly that, you know, it's, it's just, uh, I was just welcomed into this community with open arms and I'm just having a blast up here, uh, you know, just getting in, getting into the creative mode. So are you teaching or having any kind of student interactions or is it just at your residency where you have your own time? Uh, no, there have. I, I did speak with a, a class here uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we do have an open door policy. If students or classes uh, want to come by and just visit and see what I'm doing, they're certainly welcome to that. Uh, other than that, you know, I'm, I'm just here to grow, uh, experiment with uh, different techniques and like I said, you know, it's it's a very rewarding time for me up here. Bramson, we saw you recently saw the glass exhibit up in Santa Fe at the museum, and we're just totally blown away by it. We were wondering if you would just talk briefly about how those pieces were chosen. Okay. Uh, well, the the exhibit um, has been. Uh, it's been in, in the making for the last two to three years. Um, uh, Leticia Chambers, who pretty much curated the show along with Kashi, Kathy Short, who is a photographer, 
uh, collaborated and um, came up with this idea of Native American glass art and, and the movement. Uh, and initially they thought there might be about three or four, but there were over 20 of us who were working in glass. And uh, I, I was approached uh, several years ago with this idea and um, I, I just jumped into it head first. Um, and yeah, which is kind of funny because uh, when students come by and they talk to me about how I got involved in my growth in the glass arts, I said, well, you know, uh, uh, any kind of artwork uh, requires a lot of time and requires a lot of effort and a lot of uh, forethought. And one of my closing statements was, uh, uh, if you want to become an artist, just make sure there's water in the pool before you jump in. <laughs> and and I, I disregarded my own, <laughs> my own thoughts. I dived right into it. Uh, it was rewarding uh, because of just one particular thing is, is that where I come from at my community, the village of Haute Villa, uh, we're... Um, prevented or were, were warned about uh, making pottery. Uh, our older people and my uncles would tell me that uh, pottery is a woman's art form. Oh, don't get involved with working with clay because uh, a clay pot is just not a clay pot. There's a lot of uh, symbolism and a lot of meaning that goes along with that. Uh, so I never got into uh, ceramics at all. And uh, when I started doing glass, you know, that was a way for me to have the same tactile experience, uh, but using uh, a, a material that was one step removed from clay. And apparently that was intriguing to um, the curators. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why they included uh, my work in there. Uh, but it, this is really the, the entire show. It's wonderful. Uh, it's really about the introduction of glass as a medium to the Native American population, um, which goes probably back to the 70s with uh, Dale Chihuly introducing the medium uh, to Native Americans. Uh, so, you know, it just grew from that. Uh, and I think I'm part of the second generation of people who have turned to glass art uh, because previously I was uh, carving kachina dolls. I was doing other things, um, but I just just really got into the glass movement, and I chose to just uh, make that the calling in my life. I think for the benefit of uh, all the friends that are watching. Uh, Ramson, if you would mention that gorgeous book that came out of the exhibit, I just can't stop looking at it long or reading about it. And oh, they made right. it too. Yeah, well, typically, you know, when you have an exhibit in, in any museum, you're going to have a catalog that accompanies uh, the exhibit. Uh, but um, apparently, this warranted a full publication uh, <laughs> aside from a catalog. So uh, a book was uh, published, it came out, I believe this past May, it's called Clearly Indigenous. And it's a, a very, very uh, nice hardcover book. It, it briefly talks about the history of glass art with Native Americans and how Native Americans are using that particular medium to express their culture um, that is out of the box, you might say, in terms of what we call traditional Native American art. Um, and I, and you know, I look back, and, and when I first uh, discover, well, I didn't discover it, but <laughs> when I first came across uh, glass art, it really caused me to think about uh, our own traditions. You know, at Hopi. We have our kachina doll carvers, we have our jewelers, we have our painters, our basket makers, our potters, and what have you, but we don't have our glass artists. And that was 
pretty much the reason why I chose into chose to go into glass art is to plant a seed so that at some point in time uh, we would have a strong community of Hopi glass blowers. Charlotte would like to know, Ramson, what are the prices of your whirlpool bowls and the uh, the corn maidens? Um, the the prices generally are contingent upon the size and and the variety of the color that I put in there. Uh, because uh, the, the colors that we use in glass art are made up of uh, 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 minerals, uh, rare earth metals, uh, things like gold and silver and copper, uh, magnesium. Um, these types of, of metals are used to create the colors in glass. So uh, that part is, does uh, weigh in. You know, I, I factor that in, but I try to make uh, a variety of things um, that people can take home with them. So, you know, a, a small bud vase may, may be, you know, like $35, $40 to a $2,800 or $3,000 uh, blown piece that's, that has a lot of work put into it. Uh, so my price range varies. Um, I am fortunate in that um, my workshop, my shop is out on the reservation. So uh, I can work relatively undisturbed and I can focus on my art. And because of that, I, I truly believe that part of who I am is becoming part of the artwork. So to me, it's not just a piece of art. It's, it's a part of who I am as a person and as an artist. Are your pieces for sale on your website? No, uh, I, I don't really have a shopping cart thing. Uh, I'm not that tech savvy when it comes to things like that. Uh, but people do contact me and I will send out photos if I have an idea of what, ex what they're looking for. Um, the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture here in Santa Fe also ha have uh, my pieces in their uh, shop. Mm. Yeah, the other thing that I need to also point out uh, is that uh, my shop is rel relatively small compared to other uh, glass blowing studios that you see elsewhere. Uh, I'm limited in, in capacity in terms of uh, the size of the pieces that I can do simply because we are limited to propane out on the reservation. Uh, there are no natural gas lines uh, where we live. So, you know, so I'm kind of locked into the, the fuel situation. And um, propane is, it, it's pretty expensive uh, when you get down to it. Uh, so, you know, I, the, the physical size of my furnace and my, uh, my annealing ovens and all that stuff also uh, has to be factored in. Uh, I, I'm really just happy right now because I'm, I've broken ground uh, to build a brand new hot shop. And it'll be bigger, it'll be a bigger building than where, where I'm at now. And while I'm here in Santa Fe, I'm also thinking about um, increasing the actual sizes of uh, the furnaces to build new equipment here and then take it back home. At this point in time, the largest uh, piece that I can do would be 10 inches in diameter. Um, whereas I can increase that maybe by 40 or 50% um, with, 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 a, with bigger equipment, with larger equipment that has uh, a bigger capacity. Are, are some of your, is some of your work uh, here in Tucson, like at Marcotti's store? Uh, yeah, there, uh, I, I do have Mark, um, uh, some things at Mark's, uh, and also the Ameren Museum uh, in Dragoon. Ramson, where do you get your glass? Uh, the, the clear glass that we use uh, to start out a piece is uh, I get mine here in Santa Fe at a place called Prairie Dog Glass. Um, uh, it's a glass blowing studio. And it just so happens that they're in the book as well because 
there are about half a dozen uh, Native American glass artists uh, who tend to congregate at Prairie Dog in Santa Fe, and we all kind of hook up every so often and blow glass together, you know, if we're at the same spot at the same time. Uh, but I do get my glass there. Uh, I do order my colors from uh, a company up in Washington State. Uh, so that's pretty much where my supplies are coming from. Okay, we have another question in the chat. Rick and Lois Eisenstein are we're wondering if you could talk about any mentors you may have had in your early efforts to develop your glass art. Yeah, uh, actually, um, uh, Tom Philibom, who is a glass artist in Tucson, uh, was probably my first glass mentor. Uh, the other mentors that are part of my life is a jeweler by the name of uh, Charles Lolima. And uh, he, I grew up with Charles uh, and uh, we were uh, together, you know, for part of the year uh, because of ceremonies and things like that. So Charles was a mentor, uh, kind of like a life coach. Uh, Tom Philibaum was specifically uh, a mentor for glass for me, uh, but uh, you know, I, I, I got to let you know that I, I, in my entire 21 years that I've been blowing glass, I've only taken one uh, workshop, which was in, at Philibom Studios in Tucson. So 40 hours is the extent of my formal training in glass. Uh, beyond that, I relied heavily on just talking with other artists, uh, just uh, starting out small. So when people ask me if I'm self-taught, my usual reply is no, I'm not, I'm not self-taught because I can't teach myself something that I don't know how to do. So I tell people that I'm self-learned. I just read a lot of books. I watched a lot of other glass artists just kind of pick their brains. And, uh, I was fortunate enough to get an artist in residency at Pilchuck Glass School, which was pretty much my first hands-on experience. And I had two great mentors up there, one uh, uh, Dante Marioni, and the other glass artist was uh, Ben Edels from Australia. Uh, so they got me on the bench, they got me really going off the tarmac. And when I got back home, uh, I was really fortunate because another uh, artist up there helped me to build a furnace out of an old 55 gallon drum. So that's where I started, just really uh, basic homemade equipment. And as time went on and, and I got more skilled at this, I started to learn how to build my own equipment. So today I fabricate uh, everything that I need on my own pretty much. Uh, so. My other mentors were books, and my other mentors are YouTube. Barbara Hines is wondering if you could talk a little bit about what he means to the glass movement. Well, I, I, I don't have the fortune to, to know Dale, um, but you know he's pretty much the godfather of the glass in North America. Um, but if it weren't for Dale Chihuly, uh, I, I don't think there would have been a Native American glass art movement because Dale Chihuly uh, came down and built a hot shop for the Institute of American Indian Arts. And that was taken over uh, by another uh, Native glass artist who had uh, apprenticed under him. And from that point, it, it just grew. Uh, and so if it weren't for Dale Chihuly, I don't think uh, we would have had this exhibit at, at uh, Mayak here in Santa Fe. Uh, he was the first mover. He's the guy who planted the seed out there. And following in his footsteps, I'd like to plant the seed with young Hopi people. Uh, and like I said before, you know, I'd, uh, I'd like to see someday down the road, uh, a strong community of Hopi glass blowers. Now, I've only been able to convince my uh, younger grandson uh, 
uh, or the second grandson out of four grandkids to take on glass blowing. So he started in on it. Uh, and I'm hoping that he'll just carry the torch. His older brother um, just happened to uh, really like stained glass. And I, I also do stained glass work. Uh, so he's kind of latched onto that. So I've got uh, two guys who are really kind of into it right now. And I'm hoping that I can leave uh, whatever gifts that I've gotten from others that I can share that with them. Doris Rowland is wondering if you could talk about the period when you were doing stained glass. I started stained glass pretty much the same way. Um, just it, it was, it's something that really moved me early on. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, I'm a graduate of Goddard College in New England. And in, during my trips up there, I came across stained glass. Uh, this was back in the late 70s uh, when I came across stained glass. And uh, I couldn't just, I couldn't get it out of my head. Uh, and that was probably the time where I had the first thought of, hey, you know, uh, back home we have our doll carvers, we have our weavers, we have our jewelers and our painters and, potters and basket makers, but we don't have any glass artists. Uh, so actually I started uh, in stained glass before I got into glass blowing. And um, uh, when I got back home, I went to a bookstore, uh, bought some how to do stained glass books, uh, went to a hardware store, bought a $3 cutter, uh, a, a cutting wheel, some scrap glass and I just started to read books and try it out. And, uh, uh, you know, down the road again, you know, I was doing larger pieces. Uh, I entered some, some of my glass work uh, into the Santa Fe Indian market and got blue ribbons uh, because really no one was doing uh, stained glass work at that time. And as time went on, uh, my pieces started getting larger and larger, and I started entering more shows. And um, one of the largest uh, pieces that I've done was for uh, the Rollins in Santa Fe. Uh, and I, I spent a lot of time just thinking about what imagery, what concepts would I try to communicate in there. And I ended up uh, just sharing a story about how Hopis uh, look to life in general. So I started with life beginning before a person is born into this world, what life is like before birth, and then working up into uh, the life cycle on this side and capping it with a transom window that just kind of brought everything together. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time on that, uh, and uh, the, the, the toughest part was transporting it, uh, because uh, I, I brought it in the back of my truck <laughs> and had that uh, installed. So uh, I, I, I left glass, uh, stained glass for a lot of years and really got into glass blowing, uh, but uh, I've started back into the stained glass things. As a matter of fact, I just uh, uh, shipped a piece to um, Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. It's going into the Peabody Archaeological Center. Uh, that, that got shipped about a month ago, and uh, the, all they need to do is install it. Um, so I got back into the stained glass thing just recently, and now I'm, you know, I have two irons in the fire again. Uh, someone is asking, uh, just as women are the only ones working in clay, are men the only ones working in glass or is that art form open to everyone? Well, there are no rules uh, regarding glass art because it's not part of traditional culture. Um, I'm the first documented glass artist from the Hopi tribe. Uh, and you know, I just I just stuck with it. Uh, 
uh, and uh, part of it is is that I'm trying to have um, uh, that respect for our traditional ways. So I I really never got involved in clay, but there are no rules regarding the glass arts, and I just believe that it should be available to everyone at any age. Uh, so, you know, there, there, are, there aren't any traditional rules or anything regarding glass. So uh, neither it, there are, are there any rules for jewelry or painting. It seems to be just traditional arts that have certain uh, parameters and certain restrictions on them. Rick and Lois Eisenstein ask another question. Uh, they're interested in hearing how the natural landscape influenced your work. And are there any specific minerals that you like to use for your colors that are found near the Hopi mesas? I don't think the minerals play a big, big part. Uh, I think it's the color itself. Uh, because when you look at glass, uh, glass colors specifically, you have a, a pretty uh, wide palette of colors that you can incorporate into whatever you're doing. One thing that I've been, that I've done is because I'm so much into the landscape because it ties into our mythical history, is I like I like to travel, and I try to uh, capture through photographs different landscape formations of the colors and the patterns that you find in a variety of of uh, uh, rock formations. I look at sediments, igneous rocks, uh, metamorphic rocks, and try to uh, capture those patterns and those colors in the glass art that I do. Uh, so I, I really like to get up to this place called the Wave. It's in Southern Utah, where the sandstone is, is just really wavy. Uh, as a matter of fact, we looked at a slide of the Wave uh, early on. And I, I, it's one thing to look at a photograph. Uh, it's a totally different thing to actually be there. Uh, I've been to Bryce Canyon National Park uh, and I've taken that with me. So I'm exper experimenting with kind of like hoodoo type shapes in glass vessels with the colors that you see at Bryce. Um, I've been to uh, Colorado into the mountains and just looked at the patterns there. Uh, of course, we have a lot of rock and sandstone at home. Uh, so I, I usually take these treks and just photograph um, panoramic uh, photographs and down to like microscopic photographs and try to uh, communicate the landscape through that. Question from Donna Gill. Uh, she's asking, how can we contribute to you, your building? of the hot shop on the reservation and how will this be used by Hopi youth? Well, uh, let me give you a little history. Uh, my, uh, my operation is called Hot Villa Glassworks. It's the only Hopi operated, uh, Hopi owned uh, glass studio on the reservation. Um, my family, uh, they're, they're artists as well. Uh, my wife is a basket weaver. She's a blue ribbon basket weaver. Uh, my oldest daughter makes uh, yucca sifter baskets. Uh, my son and my son-in-law are both Kachina doll carvers. Uh, so, you know, it's a family of artists. So what we've done in the past uh, for, I don't know, like 20 years or so, we, we've hosted groups. Um, for a lot of years, we, we hosted um, maybe at least six to eight Rhodes Scholar groups every year. Um, there were four universities from the East Coast that would pay annual visits to us. So we look at ourselves more as a learning center than just visiting a glass artist because we all uh, contribute to uh, sharing what knowledge and what experiences we have as artists. So we do mini sessions of sorts. Um, and so we, we work with groups like this. So I, I consider myself uh, an educator yet at heart, uh, but the family as a whole, uh, we try to share our, our knowledge and our own philosophies and our own approaches when it comes to the artwork that we do. So 
uh, I've been uh, I've been working in a building that I built single handedly. Uh, and it's not pretty, but it works. But the thing is, over the years, I've outgrown it. So the week before I came here to Santa Fe, I broke ground for a new hot shop, which will be, it won't be state of the art necessarily, but it, it'll be a vast improvement on what I've been working with in the past. And now that my two older grandsons are getting involved with glass arts, uh, we're, we're really needing to expand. Uh, I'd like to set up uh, a classroom of sorts uh, with, you know, really uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, AV equipment so we can do a better job in communicating, uh, you know, what we have to offer to the outside. And, and you know, the bottom line with everything is always money, you know. Uh, and it took me about three or four years to build a shop because I, it was a pay-as-you-go project. So it went very, very slowly. Uh, and the, the, the thing that I really am grateful for is that I was able to gain enough experience and knowledge uh, about the technology behind it. So I, I can build my own furnaces. I can build my own kilns um it's it's great it's a great life uh, and so uh, you know any contribution uh is helpful because i see what we have to offer as growing not not just art per se but but sharing our culture sharing our history sharing um our beliefs and values with with the outside uh because I believe that we need to come together as humankind. We need to build these bridges of understanding and cultural sensitivity. And just trying to make this world a better place is pretty much my bottom line. Thank you, Ramson. This has just been so uh, such a nice time that we could have our people asking questions for a long time. Uh, you share beautiful works, and I certainly hope at some point we'll be honored to acquire one of your glass works for our permanent collection. So that'll be something we can maybe think about into the future. But thank you again.